Sorry, dude. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, The Arts and Cultural Production Satellite Account, New Statistics for 2018 and 2019. This free webinar is hosted by the National Archive of Data on Arts and Culture, a data repository funded by the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm uh, Anna Ovchinikova, the Data Project Manager for NADAC, and also here with us today is Lynette Holter, NADAC Director. Let's take a quick look at our plan for today's presentation. We will start with a, a brief background information about important part partnership between the National Endowment for the Arts and the United States Bureau of Economic Analysis, without which the ACPSA data would not exist. Uh, we will briefly cover history of the ACPSA and ACPSA resources available from the NEA and the National Assembly of state arts agencies. The main part of our presentation will provide you an overview of the ACPSA, key findings uh, from the 2019 data, and you will learn about the state level ACPSA data through visual charts and figures. We will also briefly talk about other satellite accounts produced by uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis. If uh, we have time at the end because we will try to uh, leave as much time as possible for your questions. Uh, if we have time, we'll talk about NADAC and ACPSA resources available uh, on the NADAC website. We'll show you how to find ACPSA resources on the NADAC website, how to uh, uh, contact NADAC for help or find help resources on the NADAC website. So let's get started. I would like to introduce our first presenter Bonnie Nichols from the National Endowment for the Arts. Bonnie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anya. So I'd, I'd like to take a few minutes um, and just, just start off with uh, talking about uh, the history of our agency, the Arts Endowment with uh, BEA about the Arts and Culture Production Satellite Account. So in 2011, um, the Arts Endowment started conversations with, with um, our speaker today, Paul Kern and, and the BEA. And in 2012, um, that was the year that the work began and there was a first uh, pilot year uh, ACPSA. So we, we fast forward now to the present, we have data all the way up to 2019. That's the, the most recent data. But of course, that year um, was prior to the pandemic, um, the, the effect of the pandemic. In fact, 2019 was a, a very strong year for, for the arts economy. Uh, between 2017 and 2019, uh, just for some statistics, uh, the arts economy grew at an average annual rate of 3%. And that, was, that rate was somewhat higher than um, the growth of the overall US economy or, or US GDP. But um, as, as I think everyone knows, um, the, the pandemic, the impact of the pandemic was, was very hard um, on the arts. Um, I'll just give you a few statistics here. Um, looking again at, at BEA data between the fourth quarter of 2019 and the second quarter of 2020, um, spending on tickets to performing arts events dropped from almost 34 billion to just 3 billion. So that was, you know, a, a terrible nosedive. Um, some data from the BLS kind of shows you what happened to employment. So it was, um, in performing arts industries, employment was 138,000 workers in April 2019 before the pandemic. But by April 2020, when we were starting to really feel that, um, employment dropped to just to fewer than 63,000 workers. So we will look to the next wave of the ACPSA data to give us a fuller um, picture of how the um, pandemic affected the overall arts economy. Um, our uh, the Arts Endowment's website uh, contains all the ACPSA data. Uh, we also have national summary reports and other related products uh, on our website. Um, also, uh, the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, as Anya uh, mentioned, uh, partners with us, with our agency, and uses ACPSA data to report um, creative economy profiles for each state. And if you go to NASA's uh, website, you can see each of, those, each of those state profiles. So now 
I have uh, the privilege to introduce Paul Kern. He um, actually uh, helped establish and oversee the production of the arts and cultural production satellite accounts. Uh, Paul has been a manager with the Bureau of Economic Analysis since 2003. Um, at the BEA, he oversees the staff that, um, that produce annual and benchmark input output accounts, monthly and quarterly estimates of PCE services, um, and the travel and tourism accounts, and the original work for the outdoor recreation satellite account. Uh, his specialties are tourism, transportation, and finance. Uh, prior to his work at BEA, uh, Mr. Kern was at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, where he developed multi-factor productivity measures for air transportation, rail transportation, and other industries. And also during his tenure at BLS, um, he trained hundreds of economists from other nations through the BLS's International um, Technical Cooperation Program, and he taught them how to develop productivity measures for their economies. So that's very interesting. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. I appreciate uh, all the kind words. And I want to thank um, Anna for setting all of this up, for making sure that my um, slides were properly arranged and that everything is going to work out very smooth for today's session. Um, I will share my screen now and we will start the presentation. So as, as Bonnie said, we're gonna talk about the arts and cultural production satellite account. And she mentioned that the first contact was in 2011. What she didn't mention was um, BEA was just too busy at that time <laughs> to really start working on this account. We started working on this account in, in 2012. Um, so let's see, what are our, here we go. So our goal and objectives for today is just to increase awareness and understanding of BEA's accounts. Um, I'm gonna introduce the idea of satellite accounts in general, and then obviously focus on arts and cultural production. Um, then I have potential avenues for research because most of you are researchers. So that's a, a point of interest, obviously. And then I'll try to answer your questions. If a particular so slide that I show really prompts a strong question from someone, I'm okay pausing and, and answering a question. Um, so that's, that's fine. Raise, raise your hand or um, um, use the chat function. So here we go. So BEA's core accounts, what does BEA do? BEA does GDP. That's, that's our absolute core statistic. Um, every month we publish a revised quarter for GDP. So we have GDP for the first quarter, but we do it three times, advanced, second and third. But we have these other things over here. We call them satellite accounts. Now, the reason these circles overlap is because the satellite accounts are directly tied to the core accounts. So most people don't realize this, but both GDP and the satellite accounts have the exact same foundation. And that foundation is the benchmark input output table of the United States, which is produced by my office. That's a product we are able to produce every five years we use census product line data. Um, and that IO table actually sets the nominal level of GDP every five years. And beyond that, I'm gonna show you a slide later on, which lets you walk from the input output table to detailed PCE tables. In, in fact, we're gonna look at um, performing arts. So what is this satellite account? So there's two broad types of satellite accounts. The first type of satellite account is to allow BEA to experiment and allow the public to become comfortable with new statistics. And basically we think of it as a way of furthering the science of national accounts. And the example for that, the prime example for that is the R&D satellite account. So for decades, 
expenditures on R&D were considered expense, just like buying paper for your printer or electricity to run your business. However, the system of national accounts, which can be thought of as the instruction manual on how to produce national accounts, it says, no, 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 expenditures on research and development are different. It's not an expense. It's expected that those expenditures, sorry, <laughs> that they will not only increase output, but change the character of output over a long period of time. So they should be treated as investment and directly hit value added. Okay, so BEA about 10 years ago said, okay, we'll, we'll try this, but it's a big change. It's a very, it's a big structural change to GDP, and it's a big conceptual change that we have to get our users comfortable with. So we created the R&D satellite account, and for about five or six years, we basically played around with data sources. Price indexes were a particular challenge, and we had easily a dozen papers and seminars working with our high-end users, mostly Wall Street, but not only, a lot of academics to get them comfortable with this idea because it was going to drop. So we waited until what we call a comprehensive update to bring this R&D satellite account into GDP. So it actually became part of GDP. And so that satellite account is no longer active. It's a nipple line. It's in GDP. The ACPSA is the other type of satellite account. So this one is more commonly known. There's more of them, and they're actually more enjoyable, I think. So these satellite accounts can be thought of as a distillation of a benchmark I.O. table to allow a particular audience, National Endowment for the Arts in this case, and NADAC in this case, but to allow a particular audience to clearly, more clearly see where they lie in GDP. So a, another one I work on is travel and tourism and outdoor recreation. So those, are, those communities came to BEA over time and said, we want to know where we sit in your accounts. And for some portions of the economy, that's an easy thing to find out because you work in an industry, that industry has a NAICS code, um, and we can follow it through the I.O. table and follow it through GDP. But for arts and cultural production, it's very difficult. There's the obvious pieces of data that you would look at, but then there's a lot of data that is just not as obvious. So these satellite accounts, what they do is they rearrange and extract from the core accounts a particular activity. And I have a really interesting example here. Um, a, two years ago, I was lucky enough to go to Tokyo to talk about the arts and cultural production satellite account. And I met with some of my counterparts there. Japan has a satellite account for the tea ceremony. Now, at first blush, you think the tea ceremony, does that really merit a satellite account? Because there's a lot of work that goes involved in correctly developing a satellite account. Bonnie can attest to that and Sunil can attest to that. Um, however, in Japan, what you have is thousands of schools, some of them official, some of them unofficial, that teach young people and, and just people in general the intricacies of the tea ceremony. So it actually is it's a lot of money involved, a lot of people involved, a lot of employment, maybe not a lot of uh, construction. We're gonna look at construction when it comes to arts in a minute, but it was very interesting. So what Japan's tea ceremony satellite account does is if someone from the outside is looking at Japan's GDP, they're gonna see the statistics calculated as you would expect to see, similar to the US, similar to Canada, similar to most countries in Europe. But then if you dig deeper off to the side, you'll find this satellite account for the tea ceremony. But it doesn't disturb the main accounts. So I sort of touched on some of these. So the evolution of a satellite account at BEA. So research, that's the one where R&D, research and development satellite account. Uh, we also have a healthcare satellite account at BEA. And with this satellite account, what we're doing is 
we're trying to fine tune and improve how we measure output or GDP in healthcare. Um, we're potentially going to measure it by disease. We're also looking at outcomes. We've gained access to this incredible set of data from the insurance companies. Of course, it's sanitized, but it lets us look at individual outcomes of interacting with the healthcare system. So two people go into a doctor's office, one is cured, the other is not, but they both pay the same amount of money. Well, the way we're currently measuring GDP and output, we're not gonna differentiate between those two outcomes, but with this micro data, we can. So the middle gray box here, we incorporate into the core BEA accounts, that would be the R&D satellite account. This third box discontinue. So there was a time where BEA worked with BTS, Bureau of Transportation Statistics, and we developed the transportation satellite account. Basically, we were trying to extract from a lot of retail trade industries, the trucking that is embedded in the industry. So it's just part of the industry. Think about grocery stores. They have their own fleet of trucks. The employees that drive the trucks are employees of the retail trade establishment. So what we were trying to do was grab those trucking establishments or trucking entities and bring them into one satellite account. I was going to say pile. That doesn't sound very technical. Anyway, so that satellite account, we produced it, it was published, and then we gave it to BTS. So it was discontinued by BEA. They still attempt to maintain it from what I've seen, but it's very, very challenging to update a satellite account if you don't have access to the underlying benchmark input output table. It's just very hard because every five years we produce a new benchmark IO table. We revise all the back years, revise all the front years and potentially add new concepts like that R&D. So these are just, this is not even a complete list. Um, I'm missing digital economy satellite accounts. Um, the ocean economy satellite account I found out in a meeting the other day was recently renamed. It's now going to be called the marine economy satellite account. And the reason for that is um, it, it's going to have inland oceans. Well, it does. So it has the Great Lakes, Chesapeake Bay. So what are called inland oceans. Uh, so it's now going to be renamed the marine economy satellite account. Um, and then the R&D satellite account at the bottom was the one that was incorporated. Okay, so now let's start talking about what, so if there's one statistic that a particular audience is interested in is what percent of GDP is my activity making up? You know, and that's totally rational. Obviously, there's a lot of statistics that lead up to this. There's a lot of work that leads up to this. So healthcare, 17% of GDP, that's not a surprise. As our country ages, we demand better healthcare. You know, we, we refuse to live with pain. We refuse to live with any sort of limitation. So we demand a lot of healthcare, 17% of GDP. That number will probably change as we refine how we measure healthcare. But right now, that's our number. Arts and cultural production. It's 4.3% of GDP now. I think it's I think it has touched on 4.6 and it's gone a little bit lower. I think in shares tend to be pretty stable. So if you think about, you know, how you calculate a share, so it's GDP and then the satellite account itself. But if the economy is really having a tough time, both sides might shrink, or if it's having a really good time, both sides might grow. So the shares tend to be pretty stable. This statement I'm providing just because, so there was, a, there was a period of time where BEA had, we hesitated. So it would have been 2012, 2013, 2012. We were about to publish our first set of statistics on art and cultural production and the leadership at BEA, they're now retired. So I guess I can talk a little bit, but um, they basically said, you know, is this something BEA should be doing? Does this, you know, does this make sense? 
is is are, are the leadership at BEA going to be in trouble if we publish this? And and it was a legitimate concern. But what we did was we we crafted this statement so that people could understand that no, this is this is absolutely a set of economic statistics that is geared towards understanding what percent of GDP is art and culture. Now, some other countries do things differently. We're not the only country that has a, an account like this. So in Canada, they include heritage. We never really entertain that. Um, as an economist, that would scare me how I would measure heritage, I don't know. Um, in Europe, these accounts tend to include sport. And I did some research on this, but if you look at a lot of European government structure, you will often have a minister of culture and sport. Now, if I'm the minister of culture and sport and I'm gonna do a satellite account, I'm not tossing sports, I'm gonna have it in there. Of course, it makes, it makes the uh, satellite account larger. Um, we specifically wanted to keep sports out of this account, and we did. Um, in some cases, it was just by not bringing it in. In a few cases, we had to figure out like actually what sports represented to pull it out of something. So over the years, now BEA is very comfortable publishing these statistics. Um, our last press release just a few weeks ago, uh, the end of March, for the, the new statistics for the ACPSA, BEA had 6,500 downloads of the press release on our website, which is pretty good. That's pretty good. Bonnie covered this, so I don't need to spend too much time on it. I would just look at that second and third bullet. So the boundary for the account was built with IO items. So an item is a detailed commodity. So a benchmark input output table, which is the most detailed statistic that BEA produces on the US economy, it's about 5,000 items, several hundred industries. So Bonnie remembers, it was, it was Bonnie, Sunil, Steve, and myself spent at least three or four months, I'm sure it was at least three or four months, basically having meetings, phone calls, looking at these lists of IO items and saying, is it in, is it out? Is it in, is it out? And then some of them, about 100 of the 480, it was like, well, it's in, but it's also out. So we have to decide. So even at the most detailed level of the benchmark IO table, we had to create a, what we called a partial or a split. Um, here's just two examples. So if I look at a benchmark input output table and I'm producing the arts and cultural production satellite account, as I mentioned, there's all these things that, yeah, that's in there, that's in there. Performing arts, of course, of course. But how about unions? I mean, unions provide a, a valuable service to artists without doubt. Otherwise they wouldn't be there. We, we assume competitive markets. So if, if these unions didn't provide a good or service, uh, artists wouldn't pay union dues and they wouldn't exist for very long. But the question was, how do we split this IO item with a dollar amount into these artistic unions? So we realized that um, an official union has to file forms with the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor is the, the referee for unions. And so they're called LM2 filings. And basically we just, created a ratio, all unions to artistic unions. And then that ratio was applied to the benchmark IO union value. And br we bring that in. It's, it's not a large amount, but you, know, you do this multiple times with multiple items and you start to add up value to the satellite account. Again, this is why we do it because someone from the outside that's interested in this sector of the economy could absolutely build something close to a satellite account. But they would be hard pressed to do some of these things because some of these things are only visible to me and my staff as they look at the benchmark IO database because it's, um, it's sensitive data. At a certain point, we're using data from the IRS, 
which is obviously very sensitive. And we're using data from what's called the BLS QCEW quarterly census of employment and wages, micro data. It's also very sensitive. In fact, myself and all my employees have to sign an affidavit every year with BLS to access the data. And for um, the IRS, we have to take, it's like several hours worth of training every year to gain access to IRS. It's called SOI, Statistics of Income. It's, it's not individual data, it's, it's um, aggregated. That's the word I'm looking for. So that's how we split up unions. Now, construction is actually a very different beast because it's pleasant to talk about because there's absolutely no disclosure issues whatsoever. So it was early on in the process where we looked at construction and we thought, you know, okay, so obviously most construction is not artistic, but you know, I've seen theaters, somebody's building a movie theater, you know, I've been to the Kennedy Center, somebody built that. Um, a library is built specifically to be a library. Um, museums are built specifically to be museums. They're not playing basketball in there. So we decided, yeah, we should make an attempt at grabbing some construction and bringing it into the ACPSA. Construction is in GDP. Construction is in the IO tables. So our data source for that is the Census Bureau. That's often the data source for BEA when it comes to values, um, not compensation, but for uh, revenue to industries. So we contacted the Census Bureau and said, hey, here's what we're doing. We need access to your most detailed construction data. And they said, well, fine, but we don't do it. <laughs> it turns out they purchased the data from an outside construction data aggregator. Um, and so we contacted them and they said, sure, fine, for a fairly reasonable amount of money, they will use this massive data set that they have. So what they do is if you think about construction, as soon as you ask for a construction permit to your local, you know, whether it's county level or state, I guess it's county level. So what, what this, this company does, this private company, is they're just going all over the country and aggregating all that data, but it's by type. So it, it's, it's, it's like literally this corner on this street in this county, they're building this museum and here's what it costs. But it's not just total cost because in order to be a time series of data, I need to have it in what's called a value put in place concept. So for this time period, how much of this structure was built? So you're saying it's gonna be a $30 million structure, that's great, but that's when they turn the keys over to the owner from the developer, that's irrelevant. I need to know how much was added to this structure in this time period, whether it's a year or a month or a quarter, and they do that. And so they provide to BEA, on an annual basis, this massive data set, it's a Excel pivot table that's like tremendously large. And it provides all these different, there's, there's more types of construction that they provide. And so it's, it's giving us all this great data. And then we're gonna see in a minute, so most of my focus is on the US statistics, but we're gonna see this data set played out in the state statistics as well. But let's go back. U.S. statistics. So here's what we provide. Current and chain dollar estimates of annual output by detailed ACPSA industries, direct and indirect employment by detailed ACPSA industries, and then compensation, and then real value added. Gross output minus intermediate inputs equals value added. Um, So the update we published in March, we provided revisions covering 2014 to 2017. But then what was unique is we also provided two new years, 2018 and 2019. That's unique. The reason that happened is that BEA has accelerated just slightly the pace that we are publishing our input output tables. So for previous years, 
the new release of the ACPSA just missed the most recent IO table. Like literally the ACP, ACPSA would be updated and then published and then a new IO table would come out. And that's, you know, it's, it, it's a wheel that spins, the data comes in, we produce the statistics, it's just a matter of catching up. But we did some reorganization within BEA over the last two years, and it's paying off by accelerating some of our statistics. So we were able to add two years. Obviously, that won't, that won't happen again, not for a while. Okay, seven steps to the ACPSA. It's a piece of cake. Um, this first one took a long time. I talked about this one earlier. That's where the four of us, Bonnie, Sunil, Steve, and myself, were just pouring over this massive spreadsheet with all these benchmark items and saying, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, maybe. Sometimes we'd have a debate. Sometimes we'd have to do some research. Um, but we got to a list. The second one is actually automatic. So. If an industry produces an item which we have said is arts and culture, well, then that's an ACPSA industry. So they self-identify. So there was zero time spent on that. The third one, that's where things got very interesting because that's the first time where I had to go to everybody in my office even people that don't work for me and say, hey, I need you to spend some time. You're the industry expert on unions. You're the industry expert on construction. I need you to take this item and somehow do some research and give me a partial. Say 10% of this item is artistic, 90% is not. And they did that. It took a couple months. Uh, then we had some meetings. They had to defend their partial, and it was very interesting. They, they, it, it took them out of their day-to-day -day routine, and they worked on something that they usually don't. So it was, it, it all worked out. The last four, for the most part, deal with coding, computer code, in particular SAS. That's just a legacy. That's the software that we use to produce the ACPSA. So once I have that structure of this satellite account, the items, the partials, the industries. I basically have a small IO table and I can now link it to the time series of IO tables, which BEA maintains 1997 to 2019. 2020 will come out in several months. Um, I can now extract and populate tables of output tables of value added, employment, compensation, and direct and indirect output and employment. Now, of course, we had to do a ton of review of these statistics. You know, we didn't just let the code run and populate a spreadsheet and then post the spreadsheet on the website. We had a lot of, um, a lot of work to do. This might look familiar to some of you, possibly um, Professor Throsby from uh, Australia, actually, Macquarie University. This is some of his work. So way back when, he postulated that, OK, we should look at art and culture, but it's not just, it's not just someone sitting at the ballet during a performance. So if you think about it, obviously, that's art and culture. But think about all the things that had to happen in order to get that person sitting in that seat for that performance. So they had to become aware of it. So potentially there was some advertising. Um, they were in a structure. So there was potentially some architecture, hopefully. Hopefully it, the, the structure met code so it was safe. I mean, most likely they're not in a structure that was built for you know sports it was most likely built for performing arts maybe not ballet exclusively but performing arts um potentially it's going to be videotaped and then that videotape will be made available um well computer games doesn't quite fit my train of thought here i'll get back to computer games um potentially there's some photographs 
I mean, there's there's more than a few famous photographers that focused on ballet, right? Some art, some artists as well. And um, that art is displayed in museums all over the world. So what this does, it's the concentric circles model of art and culture. It 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 lets you understand the flow as you move away from the core. Now, as I looked at this, the, when I first looked at this, as I was doing research back in 2011, 2012, I guess, the benchmark input output table can actually give you a mathematical relationship between these circles. So in other words, how much advertising did the Washington Ballet need to purchase to get me in the seat? I have an estimate for that. Um, Legal services is not in here, but legal services could certainly be in here because I'm pretty sure, or insurance, I'm pretty sure that the um, Kennedy Center has um, lawyers on staff or at least lawyers on retainer. Um, and they probably have uh, insurance. Well, they definitely have some insurance. Um, so this lets you understand how we move from core to outer, outer circles. Now you notice I have this slide twice and that's to remind me. So this is a potential avenue of research for NADAC um, members. So my office is just beginning to produce what will become the 2017 benchmark IO table. We're literally just early, early stages. Um, this table will be published in late 2023. Takes a while, takes a while to go through this and get this. Then the following year, 2024, the ACPSA would receive a comprehensive update, which would bring in the results of not just the new benchmark IO table, but the revised, comprehensively revised time series of annual IO tables because of this new benchmark IO table. So this means all years of the ACPSA would be open to revision. It also means the structure of the ACPSA could be open to revision. So this is where researchers from inside and outside could look at the ACPSA and say, do you include this? Do you include that? You don't? Well, maybe you should, or maybe you should consider it. And so that's where we could consider changing the structure of the account. Uh, obviously, the tendency is to add things, not delete things. But I mean, it's conceivable we've got something in here that, you know, either we didn't know about or, well, actually, that's not possible. We know about everything that's in here, but potentially um, something should be tweaked that that is in here. So that's an opportunity for research that could potentially have um, wide impact. I mean, literally could impact every year of the account. Hey, Paul. Yes. Just a quick question that someone asked. Can you give sure. the name of the person who, who created that bullseye diagram one more time? Um, okay, let me, I spelled it out here, didn't I? Do, do, do. Oh, it's um, Professor Throsby, T-H-R-O-S-B-Y. I think it's David. Bonnie and I met him in Montreal at a conference. Very nice guy. And he's with McGuire University. And I'll spell that out. M-A-C-Q-U-A-R-I-E University in Sydney. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no problem. Um, I'm used to interruptions. Uh, so if you Google him, it'll definitely he'll definitely come up. So this paper of his, I have but it's copyrighted. I wouldn't want to give it out, um, but it can be, it can be purchased and downloaded. I, I it was very reasonable. He's, he, he's a professor, a legitimate professor. So he's trying to, you know, further knowledge. He's not, not trying to, to uh, make money. Um, so this concept of his, it was, I'll never forget it because I looked at it and, and obviously I mean, he's aware of input output tables, but I immediately I saw this and I see commodity coefficients as I move from the center to the outer edge. And those commodity coefficients exist inside a benchmark IO table. How about that? Okay, now 
let's look at some results. So this is from the most recent press release. So we're focusing on the most recent years. Um, it, now it's not a surprise that art and culture is a little more dynamic than GDP um, for two reasons. I mean, that's going to be the case if you're looking at, so obviously, so ACPSA is in here, these GDP bars, right? But also if I'm looking at a slice of the economy versus the total economy, I expect the slice to be a little more dynamic. But there's another reason for this too. If you think about art and culture versus GDP, so I need food and shelter, right? Every quarter, every year, I need to eat, I need to have a house or a residence. I may not spend as much money on the ballet each year if, if the economy, um, takes a downturn. So I, I'm not showing you the time series here, but if we were to look at a broader time series where we include the Great Recession, so 2008, nine into 10, we definitely see this where ACPSA declines more sharply as we enter the downturn and then recovers more slowly as we leave the downturn. So now we're looking at some industries and we're just looking at two years because we're looking at more pieces of it. So this is, this is all ACPSA now. And if we see this, this caught my eye when we were doing the review of these estimates, I thought, wow, uh, that's, that's a pretty good growth rate, 12% in fine arts education. And so I asked my guys to, uh, prove it like you know that's how this works if so if somebody presents a growth rate that looks interesting prove it uh they were able to prove it so we use uh service annual survey data from the census bureau and for 2018 there was a pretty nice spike in growth now i did some research i mean on google um I can find articles that talk about 2018 being a good year for fine arts schools, but most education, it's a state and local thing. So I didn't find anybody that was willing to do the work of aggregating the state data of fine arts and really verifying this. So different states said, yeah, 2018 was a good year. Um, and a lot of them are probably using the same source data. So, um, we published it because we believed it. Okay, now we'll start to look at states. So a little history from the beginning, the goal was always to produce state level ACPSA statistics from the very first meeting at BEA. Sunil was there, Bonnie was there. Um, the head of NEA at that time was there. I, I forget uh, her name. Um, no, his name, his name, Rocco Landisman. Rocco Landisman, right, Bonnie? I think it was Joan Shikakawa. Oh, it was Joan, then it was Rocco. Okay, okay. Um, anyway, so great people. I mean, you don't become the head of the National Endowment for the Arts without being you know, a very interesting person that has a, a, an amazing background. So. The meeting went tremendously well. And right off the bat, we started talking about state ACPSA statistics, but the way BEA works. So when we publish GDP, that's not the sum of 50 states. We're publishing GDP using survey data that was nationwide. And if you know about surveys, you know, the larger the population, the larger, you know, you get your best survey data if you're blanketing the entire country. So GDP is calculated at the US level. Then BEA's regional directorate, we have a whole directorate that does regional statistics. Then they take that top level GDP and they bring it down to the states. How do they do that? Well, primarily using this BLS QCEW data. I mentioned this earlier, that's the quarterly census of employment and wages. But they also use data from the NCES, National Center for Education Statistics. And then this is that construction data 
that I mentioned before. So dodge construction data. So that's what allows them to say, hey, in this state, ACPSA construction really took off and potentially, again, because we're talking about states, it might be just one or two projects. That's the nature of state uh, statistics. So then when it comes to value added, what do they update? So compensation, GDP itself, again, coming from top level GDP, um, lots of census data. So although the 2017 benchmark IO table, which is based on 2017 economic census data is just being produced, certain statistics in BEA are already beginning to absorb pieces of it. We can't absorb the whole thing because that would be a break in our time series. And then um, updated NETS data. So this is interesting. This is fairly new. So NETS is National Establishment Time Series data. It comes from Dun & Bradstreet. We recently started using it recently as in the last three or four years. They look at 59 million establishments. Um, the data includes information on location, ownership structure, industrial operation, industry classification, that's very important, sales and employment. So it's, it's, it's real micro data. And then of course the Dodge construction data as well. Okay, employment growth. So the color coding is important. It's going to let you know whether growth is strong, darker colors or less strong, lighter colors. Um, Nevada, 22.9, and then Washington, 3.9, and then Wyoming. So I'm gonna, as we go through the state data, I'm gonna look at these three states. But um, let me see, I'm gonna take a little bit of a risk here and go to, okay, now, I'm on BEA's website. Is everyone still with me? Okay, so this is the landing page for the ACPSA on BEA's website. This is the release itself. So just March 30th. So you've already, I've already shown you a couple of these slides and then we start to get into the state data. So this is, I've already shown you this. This is where I wanna go. So. This is an interactive map and BEA usually does this with all of our state data. So this is the arts and cultural production satellite account. I'm looking at value added, but I can switch it to employment um, or compensation. And the states I'm gonna focus on are um, Washington. Um, there we go, Washington, Nevada, and Wyo or Wyoming. There it is, the square one, one of the square ones. Um, so let's, well, let's just go ahead and open it up. So if I click on a state, I get a state oh, we're page. we're not seeing the map that you see. Oh, you didn't see the map. Uh, okay, sorry. You're still seeing the, um, the page that lists the tables that you can click on. Oh, okay, that's my Word document. Hmm. All right, let me go back. Okay, let's go back to here then. So we're going to focus on Washington. You're, you're seeing ACPSA employment growth, the PowerPoint now? Okay. Yep. And apparently other people could before, so sorry. Oh, they could see the, the, the map. Is that right? Yes, oh. that's right. You can see it now. Yeah, okay. I, I could see it. Let's, well, let's, all right. <laughs> So this functions interactively and lets you open up any state and get the summary sheet for the state. And then it's a PDF, you can download it. We also have a zip file on the website if you wanna download all 50 states, obviously, um, rather than click, 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 click. Um, so now I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. Sorry for the confusion. Okay, so now we're back here. 
So we have employment growth, compensation growth, and value added growth. And then we start to go into 2019, employment growth, compensation growth, and value added growth. And so notice Washington, Nevada, and Wyoming. Now, don't feel too sorry for Wyoming. They're not doing really well when it comes to art and cultural production, but they do very well when it comes to outdoor recreation, which is not a surprise. I'm going to show you a map of the U.S., and it's going to have these same values, but for the outdoor recreation. So let's look at some particular states and dig in a little bit. So Nevada, 22.9%. That's for the total. And then obviously we can see it's primarily made up of construction. So total employment grew 22.9, and that's based on the construction. So we had arenas from several casinos and convention centers were renovated, not built, but renovated. Um, Allegiant Stadium was built, that's new construction, to serve as a mixed use venue, including concerts. And in fact, the opening event is going to be a Garth Brooks concert which I'm sure will be well attended. I might not be there, but I'm sure it'll be well attended. So just these three projects represent a total value of construction put in place. So remember, construction put in place, put in place in the year 2018. So not necessarily completed, but possibly, but it's not the total value of the project. It's the value put in place in the year 2018, $2.3 billion. And that's at a state level. So that's quite a bit. Now, what happens, so when you get these tremendous growth rates on a project and then a project ends, well, then you're going to have things kind of taper off in the following year, which is what we see here. Um, so um, it's, this is a, nor a normalization, obviously. Obviously, 392% is, is um, a standout year for the state of Nevada. But I'm sure if you look at Nevada over time, you'll see more than a few years where they get this sort of tremendous spike in ACPSA employment and compensation. So obviously, compensation is also part of that. If, if you're employed, you're compensated. Not too many volunteer construction workers, not that I know of. Here's compensation. So 32.9% growth in 2018. And then again, 2019, it normalizes. So that's you know not, not a surprise. So now we're looking at selected industries in Nevada. Again, construction. And now let's go to Washington. So that's a little different. Washington is obviously, you know, focuses on different things. Um, total employment grew 3.9% in Washington state in 2018. And that was mostly retail industries. They grew 5.9%. Um, we can look at data from the state itself, Washington Department of Revenue, tax revenue supports this trend. Um, total employment grew 7.1% in 2019. Construction, so again, uh, construction of a different sort grew 135%. Growth in construction stems from another arena. So this was the key arena, which is a mixed use venue. Um, they hold concerts primarily, but also cultural performances, which is how they worded it, which could be a lot of different things. But it seems like it's relevant for the ACPSA. So now we're looking at compensation in selected industries. Construction is a little bit quieter here in 2018, picks up in 2019. Other information services. Um, so we don't like to talk about companies, but obviously there's a company um, in Washington State that does a lot of um, 
uh, information provisioning, let's just say. Um, now we look at Wyoming. Okay, so Wyoming, remember, was that state that wasn't doing as well when it comes to art cultural production. Um, total employment declined 7.8% in 2018, um, and then it continued to decline in 2019. Um, construction drove the compensation declines. So here, again, it's when something happens in a prior year. Um, total compensation declined 3.8% in 2018, and it's due mostly to a decline in construction. So there was... Um, a museum, where did I, I lost my note. Oh, here it is. So the National Museum of Military Vehicles was completed in 2017. It was a $100 million project. So if I complete a $100 million project in calendar, yeah, calendar year 2017, you're gonna get a drop off in 2018. That's, that's, there's no getting around that unless you build another museum of military vehicles. So that, that construction decline is individuals that had been working on this museum. And that's the, again, that's the nature of state data. It, it's, it's lumpy, um, it's, it's dynamic, um, but when you add up the 50, well, we don't add up the 50 states, but when you, when you look at the U.S. as a whole, obviously for these negative declines, there's another state that has growth. And so things um, average out to being more um, normal. So here's compensation for Wyoming. Construction decline continues. And then so, you know, you have these mixed effects, right? So if people are leaving the state because this museum was finished construction, it's conceivable that, you know, retail trade would also take a hit. You know, it makes sense. Now, here's value added for Wyoming as well. Similar story, again. So now I'm going. F sure, sorry, go just ahead. an FYI, we're at sure. two oh one right now. Um, okay. And we do have a couple questions. So. Okay. Okay. No problem. So now I wanted to just toggle between these two maps, which unfortunately somehow I bent the shape out of one of them. But if we look at some of the states, so look at California for outdoor recreation. Okay, one point eight percent of GDP is outdoor recreation. But then we go up to arts, and it's 7.4. And then here's Wyoming. Yes, it's only 2.9, but it's 4.2 if I look at outdoor recreation. So we could see that states specialize in certain activities. Um, Minnesota would be another one. Maine would be another one. So they, they, they know what they're good at, and that, that's how they work. Obviously, geography is a factor. So these don't come out well in the uh, PowerPoints, but um, I showed them to you earlier. So here's some links. So we have uh, most of these links will take you to, well, they're, they're all going to take you to BEA, uh, even my email address, but um, they take you to different pieces of the BEA website. Okay, let's have at it. <laughs> Thank you for that great presentation. Um, one of the questions asks, can you, this is back to something that you talked about at the, um, near the very beginning. Um, can you please help me understand how to split out categories that might cover multiple, or sorry, understand how to, split out spending that covers multiple categories, such as a family buys plane tickets to take a vacation to New York City. There they do sightseeing, go to the theater and other touristy things. How does that get classified? So I yes. have the same question no, about that, multi-use good, buildings. That's a good question. So I'm going to take us to something that I have open, I think, here. Okay. 
This is a 266 page manual, which we shall now walk through slowly. Now, so this, this is the instruction manual on how to produce IO tables. Um, census product line data comes to us at an establishment level. What that means is as opposed to a company level. So an establishment level. So this family is taking this trip. They're buying plane tickets. We, the government, I'll just say, the government is going to the airline and saying, how many people bought plane tickets and how much did they cost? Okay, that's an establishment level. They maybe jump on a bus and we go to the bus company and say how much money was spent on bus tickets. They go to a hotel. We go to the hotel and say, hey, how much, how much money did you make selling rooms? Also, we ask every five years, not just selling rooms, but selling shirts that have your logo on it and food and rental of rooms for weddings and um, travel arrangements because hotels do travel arrangements and other types of services. So by collecting the revenue data on an establishment basis, we are able to parcel out to the right entities that produced the final good and service. So I'm gonna show, um, let's see, okay. Is, is, are you guys seeing table 2.4.5U? Yes. Okay. So this is, the U stands for underlying. This is a detailed NIPA table. It's PCE. At the top is goods, towards the bottom is services. So if we look at line 211, we see live entertainment excluding sports. And we see, well, we, we've already talked about the drop off. We see a strong drop off. Okay. What portions of the economy are feeding, and I use that term specifically, what portions of the economy are feeding this final demand category called live entertainment, excluding sports? Well, it's the ones you would think, but it's also the ones you might not think. Did I bounce to an Excel spreadsheet? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I'm totally aware that performing arts companies and independent artists and writers are primarily feeding this PCE category. However, guess what? Schools put on plays and guess what? They charge. So we do make an estimate for that. And guess what? You can go to a travel arrange or a travel agent. I mean, the the so I, I, I should take a step back. So this column, these are items coming from a benchmark input output table. This is 2012. We also have 2007. Every five years, we create a PCE bridge table. It allows you to walk from a benchmark input output table to a final demand category. So this is one category. We repeat. So this is line number 211. That's the same line number we were looking at. But if I were to, and I've had this happen. I had an author. He was writing a book. His name was Galen. Um, and he wrote a book on the economics of performing arts a profile of the performing arts industry, David Galen. This was a couple of years ago, and he couldn't get his head around the fact that if he looked at the industries, which were these two industries, or these three, sorry, I forgot that one. He looked at these three industries, he was seeing a larger number in PCE. And I kept telling him that every five years, we're able to create this inter-industry relationship where, no, yeah, okay, it's these three industries, sure, they're providing the bulk of the money, but guess what? Schools put on plays, schools charge, it's final demand, live entertainment, excluding sports. And also, travel agents will absolutely, happily buy you a ticket to an event. It happened to me. I'm sure I paid way more than I could have or should have by going to a travel agent to get a ticket to a play in New York, but nobody else had it. And so, yes, travel agents provide 
that service. And so that feeds into this category. Does that help? Well, thank you. Uh, sure, sure. That was, that was <laughs> Hopefully that helps. I mean, I, I can take a follow on question if, if, uh, if needed. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we do have one more question sure. I see here. Do you incorporate or verify the arts and economic prosperity studies done by the by Americans for the arts? No. So we have met with, um, I cannot remember his name at the moment, but we've met with um, staff from AFA at various conferences. They use our data. Well, they review our data. I'm not sure that they use our data. They have commented on some of our data, but there has never been any iteration back and forth between BEA and AFA. I believe it was Randy Cohen. Was that? Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Bonnie. Right, yes. right, right. Americans for the Arts do use the data very much so. Oh, okay. Okay. Great. Great. I guess they like it because they. I. I haven't. I don't know that I've received uh, any questions from them, which is good. I guess. We we do get our office gets. Oh, you, okay. Okay. All right. So you're you're answering them and they're not having to come to me. <laughs> I appreciate that, Bonnie. <laughs> no, I, I always tell them if it gets too hard, we will have to go to BEA. But okay. you know, they're there. Uh, they, <laughs> at a and, certain at a certain level, the benchmark IO table becomes tricky. No question. And Paul, uh, the person who asked the question about splitting out the spending categories, mm -hmm. has, thanks, helps a lot. Oh, okay, okay, mm -hmm. sure. And everything I've shown you is on the website. So that PCE bridge table is on the public BEA public's public website. And obviously that NIPA table 2.4.5U, you have to be careful about the U. It's on our website. For, we make it a little tricky to find. It's We kind of want you to use 244 not the underlying, just because it's more aggregated. So it's obviously a little more accurate. It has slightly smaller revisions as you go from month to month, year to year, quarter to quarter. All right, well, I think these are all questions that we have so far. Um, so I think we're gonna uh, wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much everyone for staying on. Uh, and for attending today's presentation. A huge thank you to Paul and Bonnie for joining us today. Uh, we will share slides and the recording of today's presentation with all of you in a few days. Um, please remember that you can always reach out to us with any questions. We will uh, attach uh, some slides about NADAC and NADAC's uh, information about NADAC's user support um, to the main presentation that Paul was showing you today. Um, and I think this is it. Thank you, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you, Paul. <laughs>